at the meeting. We have a quorum. Tim Rawson will not be here today. He had a, uh, an illness in the family out of town. And the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for last month's meeting, but the uh, recording secretary didn't prepare them yet, so <laughs> we'll post that for the next meeting. Discussion of draft report on potential changes in police jurisdiction. There's a draft report that Will and Paige have worked up, and since it's very short, I'll just ask them to, uh, Will or Paige, to read it. I have extra. I have extra copies uh, okay. if anybody wants one. This is the draft. Okay, I'll just I'll go ahead and read it. Go ahead. Uh, it's dated March 5th, 2018. City of Fairhope Financial Advisory Committee from Will Newberry and Paige Stalker. Recommendations in regards to police jurisdiction. Our, our recommendation is that the current police jurisdiction remains the same until the city completes the following two tasks. An analysis of costs versus revenues arising from the existing PJ. Currently neither the city administrators nor the police department itself has a cost and revenue, has cost and revenue information captured in such a way that this analysis could be undertaken. With the city administration properly segregating revenues and expenses, we recommend that a cost-benefit analysis be undertaken by a qualified independent third party. Two, a marketing campaign targeting property owners within the PJ directed towards selling the benefits of annexation to the city. Until both of these tasks are completed and the results thereof reviewed by the city and the committee, no fact basis recommendation of either keeping or changing the PJ can be made. A recommendation, a recommendation that is not founded in a factual analysis is premature and counter to the interests of residents of both the city and the surrounding PJ. That's it. Ordinarily, um, we would defer public participation or participation by anybody until the end of the meeting, but. Uh, We'll go ahead if anybody has comments on this one way or another if they'd like to speak before we go forward with uh, acting on this. I'd be happy to hear them. More data, but we are still getting more, I think, All right. in the last meeting. Why don't you so come, up to the, uh, come up to the table so people can hear you. might need my laptop because I was going to do a presentation and then this is uh, the slideshow that I put together with the information we have so far and um, when we had met in my office we had talked about no, no decision would be made without communicating I mean that's not none of this was ever going to be done it just had to be in a plan to communicate you know where we are as a uh, police jurisdiction and here's some of the data that we have found the cost is going to be hard to do until we figure out what the organizational chart needs to look like to accommodate almost 33,000 people but I did put this together and this I obtained from several different sources including Craig at the in, in the police department but the number of sworn officers recommended per thousand. Um, there's a variety of different ones. Um, and in the South and in the one that I used in my presentation on the second page, um, I believe I used 2.2, .2, but we can verify that. So the police jurisdiction as it is inside the city limits, there's our population the sworn officers needed based on that statistic. And I, I we're using really the lower end of some of these recommendations. You can see that, you know, some of these recommend even more, 2.7, 2.2, 2.5. Um, so you have inside the city limits, and then we have the number of sworn officers. Uh, we would need to still hire just for inside the city limits eight. And um, we had approved in the budget two. So we still have needs just to 
police inside this jurisdiction. Outside the jurisdiction and going by that population, I'm just using this statistic. We can use less. I'm just trying to give a comparison. It would be 72. And as you can see, we would need 35. Um, I tried to get as much information as I could. I didn't finish this slide, but I have the information on the other slides. Uh, we compared, uh, there's 32,663 uh, population in our, in our jurisdiction, 35 sworn officers, and some are off right now as well. Uh, the following cities do not have a police jurisdiction. In other words, they just do inside the city limits. And uh, Foley, their population is 17,607. Daphne is 25,913. And Spanish Fort is 8,327. And um, as you can see, our population is more than all of them. And then you'll have the sworn officers coming up here. Uh, this next page, I think I got from Craig, but um, the population, this still needs to be verified, but I use the population in the police jurisdiction because that's what you would have to, to, to use. I'm not sure if these other populated the populations are just what they police, that I still have to find out. I just want to interrupt and clarify just yep. one little point. On the second page of your handout, Does that include? Uh, you say outside city. Are there 32,000 people living outside the city? It's, that's total. Right? That's total. That's total. total. So it's that's not our out. police jurisdiction. So it's not it's outside really, the correct. city. Correct. It really it's 32,000. It's total PJ, right? Yeah. Is that right? They live outside. Right. right but the, the, what you use for this, that is the total amount correct. you would use right. okay. to determine what right. you need. But the, yeah. lab the label is wrong on this column. Okay. Well. Okay. I just want to clarify. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, and then we got the org chart for the Foley Police Department. Um, they have 17,607, again, less population than we do inside the city limits, and 62 sworn officers. Uh, Daphne um, has a population of 25, 913, still less than us, 54 sworn, sworn officers. And uh, Fair Hope. Spanish Fort, well, we couldn't obtain an organizational chart, but they have the population of 8,327 8, with 21 sworn officers. And this- Excuse me, one more question. Mm -hmm. so, clarify for me, are school resource officers sworn officers? Yes, or they're police they officers. Or are they special category? They, they are that includes this. Police yeah. officers assigned to a school, is that right? Yes, but they they're could, sworn officers. But they could- like on the next day, be a regular police officer. Yes, if we want to. If you want to. Once you make a decision, though, to have that, you need to well, I fill the other but one. I mean, yeah. But the person, if 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 there was a need to fill in for some other officer, oh, right. he could yes. move on. He yes. or she could move on. All right. That's second, fine. Second question. Uh -huh. Are these all full-time people? Yes. Okay. That's one officers are. But that's right. really all we're talking about right now. Okay. Um, the records and stats for inside and outside the city limits. Um, we broke it down to two years, and thank you, uh, Lieutenant Hamrick, for putting this together. <coughs> These are all the record stats for March 2016 to 17, and then 17 to 18. And you can see that the jurisdiction on the bottom was 44.84 percent you know 16 to 17 and now it's 51.1 percent the next page is the y'all can analyze this more and believe me i have lots of questions and i know we need to get more but at least this is you know evaluating it based on the numbers um this is uh fiscal year 17 and 16 and we have the police jurisdiction revenue as it stands for both of those and then uh, Jennifer Olmstead broke it down to one and 1.5 miles out 
just to give us an example of what that would look like. Some of these numbers you have to just split because uh, she said she couldn't separate beer, wine, and cigarettes uh, in the jurisdiction. So, and then the last column is the total amount of taxes, but I, we're only showing you that total so you can see the percentage of, of these other situations with the full jurisdiction and then 1.5 miles out. All of this money is not spent and earmarked for police jurisdiction or police department. It's just to give you an idea how those numbers reflect for the total. And then um, the last one, you know, the more questions we need to ask um, is what, and bringing a third party in was, is great, um, to find out what personnel is needed if we keep the jurisdiction the same. And, um, and then maybe even look at 1.5 miles out the impact fees, which are being evaluated now, will be additional income to go to the police department, but the only ones who pay that are the developers or anybody developing inside the city limits. So we really shouldn't look at that as just additional income to subsidize well, they're not, outside. It's not ongoing. It's, it goes up and down depending on... It's, it's more like one-time money that varies. It's, we, year get year. It, we get it every year because I know it's we 1%. get it every year because what I'm saying is the impact fee is, depends, unlike taxes, which, which is all the consumer spending, impact fees depend upon the number of developments being developed. People want to buy it. So it can go up and down right, considerably in any given year. We're the fastest-growing city. I, so I get we, we, we can count on that, and that, and that percentage will likely increase because we do have serious needs in the police department and 10 years ago we didn't have this the needs that we have today and that's when the last time the impact fees were done in fact it's the smallest amount of that one percent that's collected mm -hmm. so we definitely will be able to use impact fees every year for increasing our mm -hmm. police force yeah, that's a it's a valid point the one thing I don't see, and I don't know if you, if it's in any of these numbers here in the police jurisdiction, is that you've got the arrest made, but you have no, you have no income from the arrest, no revenues. Right. The I'm not sure if Jennifer's here. She she explained to me, and I didn't. I'll have to look up the email, that, you know, a lot of that goes into uh, magistrate and that would have to be more digging so i think that's another question to ask but it's it's not going to be a lot a lot of money mm -hmm. she told me uh, i think the last time she said it was two hundred forty eight thousand dollars but we have the expense of the jail and meals yeah. and all that i mean there's but not just, just from a revenue standpoint right not from a cost standpoint just from a revenue standpoint she said it was two hundred forty eight thousand dollars from the police jurisdiction now i don't know if that's right or not but it's not included in your revenue stream. Right, but we would have to break it out, like I said. It would be a percentage so, inside and a percentage outside. I think you're just going to be increasing it according to the percentage. And my question is, are these all the revenue streams? All, all I'm giving you right now are the revenue streams that um, Jennifer okay. gave me. And so the if there are any more, then... So the question is, if there, are there any more from a standpoint of of including all the revenue streams from the police jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just asking that from a, from a number standpoint to, to make a... I just uh, think all of these questions and more, everything that y'all can bring to the table right. for mm -hmm. questions should be asked and answered before you come up with a recommendation. Well, I oh. think I, the way I well, interpret... Yeah, the said. way the way I interpret the draft report mm -hmm. is exactly that way. We're, what we're saying is um, in the draft that although we've received a lot of data, and I think we know a lot more now, all of us, than we did before we started, that we still need more factual data before we right. can go forward. And then... I, I've never... Yeah. No, no, no. I, I've and always that, said and, that. And so we're saying, 
you know, there are some things that we'd like to see. One of the questions that Will raised and a couple of others mentioned in the draft report, and then I think it can be reopened and evaluated. We're not right. making any judgments on it right now. Right. And again, keep in mind that we're approaching it, or trying to anyhow, on mostly an economic basis, not from what I'd call a political basis, although we've mentioned it. This is absolutely economics. Right. It's, it's political more than the, anything. Political in the sense of the, the, the motivations on whether or not it creates uh, more or less interest in annexation if the threat is there to pull it away and things like that. I think I it's mean, a plan. It's, it, it's, it, even if it doesn't happen this right. year, it's just a conversation about yeah, a plan. We, we, I think we're at a good opening, and mm -hmm. I think that the conclusion we've reached is fair and says we've gotten a lot of data. Um, we're well informed and now we know additional questions to ask and when those are answered then I think we reopen the investigation I, I think that's where we're at well you know one thing the is, evaluation is you say you don't have your cost analysis yet based on what I mean what our cost is from can y'all do that <laughs> I mean I'm trying to get as much as I can yeah. for y'all but these are it's a lot more information than you had before right and you know this is not even going over the fact that as I ask more information, you know, one of the things that is important to ask is what is the caseload for investigators? And, you know, right now we're in 2013, we had seven investigators. Today we have three. Um, the estimated average caseload, based on the information that I was given, but we might need to ask more questions, is 60. It should be 15. I mean, there's a lot that goes into this and a lot more questions to ask, but it's not case closed. It's we need to ask more questions because this is about public safety, mm -hmm. not politics what? and what? finance. It's about public safety. Absolutely. And if you've got 60 caseloads that an officer is trying to work, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get any results. Okay. Fair enough. The second, the second part was the marketing yep. campaign. Right. The, the, so when you figure out a plan and a, and a time frame, then you go out and then you, you talk about the benefits of coming in. Right. And then basically let everybody know. It's not, you have to outline an area that you want to work on that you feel like is going to have most of the growth in the next couple of years, filling in the holes. And I brought the, um, I think this is pretty telling here. Is that the map of the uh, PJ? I know it's actually the map of Eastern Shore PJ. Mm -hmm. I have a smaller one, but let's see if we can see this. I think this is what we got last uh, meeting, wasn't it? Actually, you didn't, this you didn't get we this big one. We didn't get the big one. Okay. Uh, All right. Um, the pink is our police jurisdiction over here. Mm -hmm. The green is Daphne's. And the blue is Spanish Fort, and I think you can see mm -hmm. that this is a huge area. And then the holes that I'm talking about is you're not going to concentrate out here on annexation. You've got to concentrate on filling in holes right now and then plan the growth accordingly. Mm -hmm. But until you build an incentive, you can probably speak to this better. And really, Richard, too. Right. And when you talk about annexation for fair, it's a little bit different from Daphne and Spanish Fork. I'm Wayne Dyke, by the way, the planning director. Um, outside of Daphne, a lot of that is county zoning outside of Daphne. And also outside of Spanish Fork, a lot of it's county zoning. Mm -hmm. Outside of Fairhope, the vast majority is unzoned property. So you've got a proposition where you're trying to sell somebody to annex into the city of Fairhope at the same time. They're unzoned now. They can do whatever they want to with their property. And then if you come into the city, they get zoned. So we've got a little bit of a disadvantage there. I still think we could, as far as a marketing plan, we could certainly come up with something and, and uh, show the benefits and the difference in cost. Um, during my early part of my career, I did that in Georgia, and we put together a, a stat sheet, basically. And we would go to a property owner, we target property owners and say, here's what you're paying now, here's what you could be paying, and so forth. How did it work? You know, it's limited, but it, it, it depends. Some people just don't want to be in the city. I mean, so some, they want some people don't even know they're not in the city. That, that's true. That's, that's true. true. But, but, but you have some that are open to it, and you have others that are just, I've lived sure. here for my whole life, and this is my farm, and or what have you, and um, I don't want to. So it's a little bit of a, 
you know, <clears throat> it's a little bit of a, a, a mixed bag. Um, I know that for us, it's, we're very, um, you may have read, we just recently got funded by, by the Restore Act for a new conference plan. I would envision that also being a part of this plan too, is having an annexation plan, having a growth plan, and marry together the utility component with growth, with the transportation and so forth. Um, and I would see us having an element of that plan be an annexation plan as well. Mm -hmm. So we're not annexing just to annex, we're annexing, annexing property in a fashion that's still meeting Fairhope's needs for growth and development over the next 25 years. Um, and so that's what we hope to do with that as well. So and, and it would be a choice. And we're not doing, that's why we're communicating the facts and doing it this way, unlike a lot of cities. Mm -hmm. I, like, so. I like the approach that you did before where you went out to each property owner mm -hmm. and you had a bullet presentation yes, sir. of what are we trying to sell mm -hmm. and what are the costs of that sale. Right. So it, everybody, everybody's going to be different, like you say. Mm -hmm. but there's some people that are going to say, well, oh, I, you know, I wasn't in the city. I was getting all these benefits. Right. Yeah, and I want to be in the city. I want to yeah. make, make sure I'm a contributing part to the city right. of Ferrup. And then also, I think, just from, you know, and you all know this, Ferrup's a popular place. It's a place people want to be. And being in the city of Ferrup, I think, adds value to your property. Absolutely. If you're a developer, it adds value to your property if you're a developer. Uh, and so I think that's, a, you know, that's another key way we can... Uh, encourage that as well, encourage development. But but going to property owners, is, it's very important. Um, I know that even today we meet with property owners who are outside the corporate limits that may be in key areas, key intersections, and we try to work with them kind of hand in hand. I believe that uh, planning and development, you know, we're, it's not us against the developer. We have to work in concert with them and get the best quality development we can get inside it, and then also try to bring them inside the city of fair corporate limits to add the tax base and just grow the city in a way that's responsible and is in, a, in accordance with a plan for the future and that's what we hope to do. Do you have the resources with inside the city employees to make that possible? Well I can only speak for the planning department. I mean right now I feel like we're pretty good shape in the planning department um, but now when you start having an annexation plan and you go out and start meeting with people that's a lot of research because because I, I would like to research the property. I mean, I'd mm -hmm. like to get a group of people together and research the property they have now. Um, you know what they're paying now, what we can offer them, and really have a, a fact based approach with meeting people, not just say which would be you part of the in, but I want to be able to show them data. Mm -hmm. Here's why you should come in. You've got to give them a reason. That's right. To want to come in, and I, I think it has to be factually, and it has to be what are their benefits, and mm -hmm. what's it going to cost them. And, you know, like when you did this, you mentioned it, that you had a similar undertaking, excuse me, in Georgia. Uh, just curious as to like how long did that take and what were the overall results? And then I've got another question, and that was, have you had any people around here that have called you up, you know, to ask you about some planning issues and so forth, and they discovered that they weren't in the city? Uh, in my time here, I have not had someone who did not know, but I will tell you, when I, I was the county plan director for about 10, 11 years, that happened all the time. People were, would call me thinking they're in the county, they're actually in the city and vice versa. So that's a very, very common, especially when you have a kind of a patchwork of, of mm -hmm. uh, corporate limits like we have. It, it's very difficult to distinguish between whether you're in or out. And most people don't look at the tax, the tax bill will tell you, but most people don't mm -hmm. look, some people don't look at that. Um, so that does happen a lot. Um, as far as the success of the annexation programs, it, it you know it was kind of a mixed bag. Um, some people saw the value of being inside the city limits, especially when you show them that they're going to save money on their utilities and so forth. That's the biggest thing that we had in Georgia was the utilities were cheaper, and we would show them you're paying this now, you're paying garbage this. is cheaper. Yeah, and, and you get you know um, you get better garbage. We, we pick up twice twice a week, and the county picks up once a week. Um, that's a big and it's cheaper. Right. And we have Plus recycling. Then this is the city school system. I mean, to the school system. Well, then right. Yeah. If so we had a city school system, school? that would be something yeah. that would be probably yeah, local. Well, you, be know, you don't get a city school system. Right. Right. Thing. right. But in, in those places, we'll which, what I would say is, you got to look at all the advantages that you can that we as a city have. And we do have a lot. Being in it and so this is what we have to offer you. Mm -hmm. But you, the caveat is that yes, you have this communication, but it's backed up by a plan that we're going to do. You can't just say come into the city and you have nothing else to show for it. You're coming into the city because the plan, whatever that may be, could look like, okay, we're going to do one and a half miles, you know, during this period, and then we're going to restrict it 
eventually to what many cities are doing across the the nation, and that is policing the in, inside the city limits because it is a very expensive thing, and people have to contribute. If, if I could add too, as far as the police jurisdiction and the planning jurisdiction, those are two different things. Planning jurisdiction is for subdivision reviews and so forth. Police jurisdiction, and that goes up five mi up to five miles. Police jurisdiction goes up to three miles. That's pretty unique to Alabama. Um, I don't know if there's another state in the southeast that has this. There's only a handful of states, I believe, that I'm aware of that has these extraterritorial jurisdictions. It's very unique to Alabama. Um, and so it's a little bit different. You know, if you go to Florida or Georgia or whatever, it's, it is clearly, there's clear distinguishing between the city and the county. Um, uh, but there's a purpose for that. Year, many years ago, there's a purpose for police jurisdictions. Well, the question, the question there is, one that has to be answered. What is the city? What is the city of Faro? Mm -hmm. That's right. What is the city? Well, the incorporated what area. The city? Mm -hmm. Is what? Is it city is. is it just the city limits? Well, I mean that's what. You well, know the, the yeah. corporate yeah. limits are, are usually what makes up yeah. the city. Everything okay. else is the county. And what I would say is, well, is is that you have the legal entity of the city, which is the corporate limits, mm -hmm. and then you have all those people who identify right. themselves as being Fairhope. But not legally inside the city of Fairhope. So right. you've got, you know, now. So that's the one question that has to be answered. What do we consider the city of Fairhope? Right. Right. Mm, that's, that's really more that of a person. public <laughs> perception, really. Uh, but um, I do think it is, regardless, we're all in this together. And we all have to contribute. We all have to be a part of a plan so that we don't lose what's special about Fairhope. And that all that has to be taken in consideration. Right. And that's why we're, we're excited about a, a, new, a new growth plan for Fairhope. And, and really, um, so as we annex and as we grow, we're growing in accordance with that plan, which is, again, tied to our, util our ability to serve the utilities. And, um, you know, if we, can, if we have an area that we know is going to, we expect to see high growth and our utilities could be run, we could get more bang for our buck by having more customers in that area. And, and so everything could be sized properly and all those kind of things. That, that's, when it starts, that's when you start seeing a growth plan. When you start merging that with utilities and infrastructure and all, you can really, really be much more efficient on how you serve and how and who you serve, based on guiding growth to areas that we expect to see it, so we can prepare for it by adding uh, increased capacity for infrastructure and roads and those kind of things. I think we, once you do that, I think you you've got a solid plan and a solid plan to move forward in the next 25, 25 years. Well, or so. Wayne, I'd like to follow up though on Will's question because I think there's more to it. Um, than meets the eye. Um, what I think is the intent of Will's question is, is this, is the current, the limits of the current PJ right now are fairly arbitrary. It's about three miles and it's been adjusted for certain roads, but it's arbitrarily three miles. Correct. And if it were to shrink down, say, to 1.5 miles, that's another arbitrary number that you know, is smaller, but it's still arbitrary. And I think Will's question is that if, you know, what is the city, does it make sense for someone to sit down and look at this map and actually draw lines around it and say, well, the way we envision the city of Fairhope is that, and I'll just make it up, uh, if you start drawing lines, where you pick up most everything you've got right now and you bring it back in it, in areas where you think it makes sense. Right. <clears throat> For whatever reason, you say, uh, inherently the city of Fair Oak should look like this. This is what we want it to look like. Mm -hmm. In this many years. Yeah. Right. And then maybe the thing to do is to say, well, depending on how the numbers work out, maybe what we want to do is neither a three mile nor an arbitrary one and a half mile, but what we want to do is say, well, we want to pull our PJ back to where we think the city limits you can't do that. ought to be. Well, that's, and that's a question of how, how can you I mean, we can see it legislatively, you know, but we, we've is talked it, about is that. Is it a and legislative a, issue or is it a negotiation? Gulf Shores has a, a funky, is it a negotiation between yeah. the sheriff and, and the city? And I think, I think it's legislative. We, we can certainly get an answer to that. Um, I know that Gulf Shores, theirs varies. Uh, it's three miles in some places, and other places it's a mile and a half. 
Uh, uh-huh. and so, I, mean, I mean, that's see what, what I'd start out by saying is what do I want? I think right. that's right. Will's question. What do I want? What do I want the city of Fairhope to be? Right. And then establish your goal and then find out how to work to your goal. Right. If it's legislative, how do we lobby our representatives, whoever they are, to achieve that goal? If it's a negotiation with Haasman, well, how do we achieve that? Right. If it's some third avenue, well, how do we achieve that? But I think rather than just say arbitrarily we're going to shrink it because we can save a little bit of money is is you know maybe a short-term uh, improvement but it misses the strategic goal and I think that's what point Will is trying to make okay, I'll, strategically I definitely wanna, what's the goal that we want to have sure, sure. I want to be clear I, I have said. never tried to ever and everything that I have ever recommended was based on communication and having a plan I've never said we've got to rein it into a certain amount. I've said we've got to look at this. I'm, I'm not so picking we, about I've, anything you may yeah. or may not have said. I'm right. Just it's to, always been I'm about just we need data. To embellish on, on Will's point, which I thought was incredibly important, is we ought to have a strategic goal. Right. right. And, and we and, talked about that. And, 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 and I think providing you all the best data that we can gather is, is very important. I think that's what we want to. And I well. think. Going forward, you want your, your strategic goal. Well, you got a five year strategic goal and you got a 20 year strategic goal as to what is the city of Fairhope 20 years from now. I mean, where is yeah. it going? Let's mark some lines. This is where we're going to go and five, try to get to in five years, and this is where we're going to try to get in 10 years and yeah. in 15 years. I mean, you have to have that as to what is the city of Fairhope. And you have to have those kind of those lines drawn so you can. Make a determination of, all right, this is this is this this is the way we want the city limits to look in five years, and we're going to do one and a half miles outside of that for police jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey, Wayne. Or, Sorry, so on and so Sorry. forth. So you just have to, yeah, you have to have that, so you can move forward without arbitrarily moving forward. Right. Exactly. What's what's the the legal with the island annexation clause? I mean, that's a well, that to to voluntarily annex into any any corporate limits in, in Alabama, you have to have a physical touching of property. A point to point, it's not physical. You, you got to share a common border. If you share a common border, I don't care if it's a foot wide or 500 feet wide, it's a legal touching which you can voluntarily annex in by petitioning the city and coming before the city council and, and annexing in. Anything other than that, you it, it's going to probably take uh, legislative action from the from the Baldwin County delegation. Um, it happens fairly often. Uh, every session, if you look, you'll see annexations that are done by certain cities. Um, and essentially what I would recommend with that, if we want to do that, we sit down with Leslie Lab delegation from the county and ask them to sponsor a bill, and then they will call for, use it as a referendum, uh, where people in this area, uh, they a defined area, can vote for to be annexed. But that's, the, the steps have been taken legislatively for that action, for the island annexation calls, correct, or no? Uh, but as far as the city of Fair, I don't believe we've we've approached the legislature about that um, on any kind of. It's basically a local, a local. Right. Deal. The way I understood it, and I could be way off, was once you reach a certain population within the city, whether you know through the annexation process, you can go to the furthest areas mm-hmm. of of annexed property, and basically say, right. and whether that's done with a referendum, you take everybody in that area and you say you're going to vote to come into the city of Fairhope. And that establishes what the right. boundary. That's, that's, 25, that's, that's a majority vote. Twenty-five thousand right. people. Once you reach twenty-five thousand. So we're you know a couple of years from that mm-hmm. option right. yeah. of annexation where people well, the, would get. That's a, you know, that's a fifty-one percent vote. And the key to that, right. the key to that is that it's based on number of voters, not necessarily acreage of land. So, right. It's so if you have, voters as, in the, as a simple example, if you have um, four or five farmers with large tracts who don't want to come in because eventually they want to be able to zone it any way they want and turn it into development, but you have 40 or 50 uh, homeowners who right. live in that same area, define that as, as your target, and then those 30 can override the, the few that don't want to come in. I, I think, that, I think that, 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 that's, that's exactly right. It's the registered voters residing in that area. Yes. If and you look at this map, too, I mean, you got a lot of touches here right you got our pockets and when I look at Daphne in Spanish Fort two things jump out at me first of all I don't see anything whether whether maybe Daphne 
uh, has any pockets like this. I see a couple on the map that look like they're, they're, they're you know, defining their PJ, and they do have some outliers like down here. I'm also looking at Spanish Fort, which if the population's right, it's only about 8,000 people up there. And this PJ here is 32,000. Um, and so I'm surprised at how dispersed Spanish Fort is up there. Uh, it, it just kind of looks at, you know, I look at it and see that. But what I think that, you know, if you've got situations where you've got people that would like to come into the city that don't know that they're in the city and, and you have these touches, it would seem like to me that, that really a, a good marketing effort mm -hmm. Is the key to it, right? to getting them there. It, and to it, it can be very positive outreach. Mm -hmm. What we do to sell when we do the the uh, comprehensive land use plan. Right. I mean, it's it's a whole package, and that's why it's going to take two right. years to right. do this plan. In fact, I real quick try to add some clarity to to um, Daphne mm -hmm. and Spanish Fort and how they look uh, geographically. Um, I think about in the late eighties or early nineties, Daphne was a, before they were a very small town, and they had a referendum to annex. Lake Forest, and so you had large blocks coming in. So you see this large block here, that was mm -hmm. likely done through a referendum. Mm -hmm. Spanish Fort's a relatively new community, I think mm -hmm. they, they incorporated in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And so you see, you know, a large block there, which was, which was part of that, that initial incorporation. Fair hasn't done that. I mean, Fair kind of just organically evolved with annexation. So you do see a more of a quilt, quilt work, patchwork. I think that's because we haven't had any of these big blocks. Right. referendums or annexations and we you know obviously we were incorporated many many years ago well before Spanish Fort was and now a lot of this area here you see in Spanish Fort it's it's really undeveloped there there, okay. are, there are a few but it was all annexed in, in large blocks but going up 225 is fairly rapidly developing right yes sir and, and up up in 225 all around um, Spanish Fort it's all zoned county zoning um, out here it's all county zoning around Daphne the only place that has county zoning in Fairhope's uh, police jurisdiction or planning jurisdiction is Montrose, a little small area in Montrose, kind of 98, tip, almost 98 west, and then also down scenic 98 in Henry 1. But the, would that differ if you gave up that police jurisdiction? No, it wouldn't have any effect on, on, on the county zoning. And what I've seen is that when, if you're already zoned the county and, and you're in the city, you're already under some kind of language control, so people, it's not that big of a deal. But if you're unzoned and you could do whatever you wanted to, it's a little more of a decision factor as far as annexing in. Because once you annex, um, right now, unless you ask for a certain zoning district, you come in as R1, which is the single family low density zoning. You can request um, sort of a conditional annexation based on getting a certain zoning, and that would come to the council to be decided. Um, but uh, but when, and when it's unzoned, it does create a little different dynamic as far as annexation decisions for undeveloped properties. If you're already developed and it's a subdivision, it's not that big a deal because you're already developed, you already have your entitlements and your <coughs> development and so forth. Well, is there any complication between who decides zoning and who decides whether you want them in the, in the city limits? So, um, so if I understand your question, when they decide to come in, if they're asked for a zoning that we don't agree with, yeah, um, you know, the, the zoning, does it, when you come in for a, a sort of conditional annexation, it, the, that zoning request and annexation request goes to the Planning Commission for a recommendation to the City Council. Ultimately, the City Council will be the decision makers on that issue. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, that's why it's important to have a land use plan and meet in advance. For example, um, we do a lot of pre-application conferences where before a developer applies, we like to meet with him first and say, okay, here's the criteria, here's the things that you're looking at. It, it, it involves utility, it involves road, it involves zoning. We want to meet them in advance so they know exactly what we're looking at. And I, I would envision with a land use plan and annexation, we would do the same thing. Here's what we envision this property to be developed as. Um, and so as a property owner, or a developer wanting to come in, you, you know in advance what we would anticipate and what we would support uh, as far as annexation. It, it well, also brings Which is more important? But Getting them in the city limits or proper zone? Well, I, I would, in my opinion, it'd be 
Now, we're at a disadvantage because bear in mind that they, they, you can do certain developments outside the corporate limits with no say so at all from, from, the, from the city. Right. Um, I, in my personal opinion, in my professional opinion, I would not want to sacrifice quality growth for the city in exchange for a few dollars in an exception. I, that's not something that I would, I would recommend because um, I think long term, the quality growth will far exceed the benefit, will far exceed a few dollars of annexation. And everybody wins. So, so. Um, so that's why, I mean, if you're asking me which one would I prefer, I would prefer someone come in that's going to be consistent with our growth, our, our plans, and, and, and our growth projections and how we see the property develop. I would much rather see that rather than just annexing to annex. Because if, you, if, if you're not careful by annexing that property, you're getting a few dollars in exchange, but if it's the wrong kind of development and the wrong kind of uh, intensity or so forth, you're going to spend more money on that from your city resources. That's why it's important to have this uh, to grow in an organized fashion. So we're planning well in advance um, our uh, you know our resources we're going to allocate to those people who are coming in. Um, uh, there are places that annex just to annex, and you have uh, island annexation that's five miles away. That needs to be that part. Of, that probably needs to be part of your sales program. Then mm -hmm. is to say we want you in the city limits for but. but here are your choices as far as right uh, as zoning goes. Right. So, well, uh, uh, so it, it, yeah, it, instead of somebody being blind mm -hmm. and not knowing what you know what their options are, right? The company, if you're going to have it in a sales program, it needs to be in your sales program. Here are your here are your options to come into the city limits as far as zoning is concerned. Right. And, and when I say you know when when we look at long-range planning and comprehensive planning, we're not talking about a zoning district. We're talking about a, a land use district that encompasses several, probably even more than several zoning districts that would be consistent with that with that long-range planning effort. So it wouldn't be, if you don't come in as R2, we're not gonna take you, it, would be, it wouldn't be that, it would be much much broader, it wouldn't be that draconian, it'd be much much broader spectrum of things someone could ask for. I'm sure that in these pockets that are in yellow that are surrounded by the city limits. There's some ideal zoning for that property. Absolutely there is, you're right. And so you, you be basically need to tell the people when you present it to them, say this is, this, is, this is what we want you to do, this is our sales program, and this is what your property's gonna be zoned. Right, right. And, and so, I'll tell you, I mean, even in the past six months, there's been, there's been um, Key locations that are in the unincorporated areas of of the city's police jurisdiction that people have discussed potential development, and we try to facilitate them. We try to send them what we think is the prop, is the best uh, zoning district they could request that's consistent with our comfort plan we have now, and also consistent with what they desire for their property. Um, the city has a series of village center districts uh, that we have right now, and so. Um, on our comfort plan, we have these village centers that are located at 181 and Greeno and um, I mean, Greeno Road and, uh, and Fairup Avenue, 181 and, and Fairup Avenue, and then also at 104 and Fairup Avenue. And we've said, hey, it, this is, if you did this, this would be consistent with the city's growth projections and what, we, what the city's identified as the locations we would like to see that kind of growth. And if, in my mind, if they chose to do that, we would fully support them and help facilitate that as best we can because it's consistent with how the city has envisioned us growing. And it's our job to help carry out, as far as planning and the city staff, help carry out the vision the city has set by facilitating this kind of development that's consistent. And we, and what we, you're speaking of is a comprehensive plan that was done by Thompson. Is uh, done by Thompson, but Thompson yeah. updated one that was done uh, in 2006, right. I believe it was. Right. And, but the, this village concept was right. initially proposed in 2001, I believe, uh, and we've updated it through the years. Right. And so really what you're speaking of is what Will said earlier, is what is, what is Fairhope? What is it gonna, what is it gonna be in the future? And what you're really looking at is the quality of, the, of that growth over time to meet with what the people that are here uh, really want and envision right. for a long time to come. That's right. I, so I want to add something big, big about the, the land use. I mean, this is $650,000 that we are going to encompass all of this in the conversation because it isn't just about police. It is about everything. If they're part of a plan and they're communicating with their immediate neighbors when they en envision their future, 
then if they're under a bigger plan, they all win. It's, it's when, you know, the conflict happens when, the, you know, your neighbor, when you're in the county, does something and it's not in line with what you want. Right. And so <clears throat> this comprehensive plan is not, it's going to be citizen gauge. We're going to GIS areas, go out there, do charrettes, bring in all of the experience uh, and knowledge in. So we're giving all the facts. But it's, it's going to be a roadmap for our future. Right. And if I get what the mayor says, she's exactly right. One of the things we're going to do first is, first of all, have some population projections for the city of Fair for the next 20 to 25 years. What are we, what are we dealing with? What are we going to try? We, we need to know how much new citizens we expect to have in the next 25 years. Once we, once we know that, or at least have a good idea of that, then we can start formulating, okay, let's plan it where we can accommodate that growth in the right locations. Once we do that, then we start tying in the utilities, the water, the sewer, the well, gas. First of all, you have to know what the city of Fair Hope is. Yeah. True. So you got to have you got to have a, a the plan That's how you before, go out you, and before you can do your population true. studies. But this, but our studies will, will go far beyond the corporate limits because 25 years from now, the corporate limits won't be what they are today. So this plan will look out beyond that, mm -hmm. where we expect to see growth in the next 20 to 25 years. And so, as we as we as we try to understand how many people we think will be here in 20 to 25 years, then we'll start again looking at the natural environment first. Uh, we we don't want to build in wetlands. We don't want to build in areas that have flood zones. We want to locate development in the appropriate place, and then start look start planning on utility infrastructure to serve those needs mm -hmm. in the future, and start having it all incorporated into, into one long-range plan where we're, we're planning for not only population, utilities, uh, other infrastructure, roads, parks, all those things are included. So when we do grow, we have a blueprint, we have a roadmap of where we want to go. And that we know that when people come in, they'll, they'll have the same quality of life that the people who are in downtown Fairhope or in the other areas of Fairhope will have. But you have to have that plan in place. So, uh, you know, as development occurs, we would be continually looking at it is is the proposed development in front of us today consistent with our plan and I think you have to be very diligent in ensuring that, that your plan is being followed because if you don't if you don't follow the plan it's no good it'll sit on the shelf and draw draw dust and there'll be real pretty maps and all but it won't be any value to you we want to make sure that's incorporated in every decision we make it, it, it will even go beyond language decisions it may be decisions on park space where we're going to put a new park there and what areas need to be served and so forth. So, okay. Um, but we're very excited about that. It's, Thank you. I, I think it's going to be a really a, a pretty a pretty unique uh, a unique plan and we can this out for sure. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Wayne. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Then from Will or Page, do I hear a motion to approve the report? So moved. And a second. second. Is there any other discussion by the committee? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All in favor of approving the report and forwarding it on to City Council, say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed? There being none, motion carries. Thank you. Richard Peterson. Good afternoon. Would you uh, come and join us at the table? I do have a goal. All right. Let me, uh, yeah, I know what your goal is. <laughs> I uh, make a few opening remarks. Uh, I need to get that one back. I got you a color. Uh, has this got you, all your cheat notes on it? I got you a color. Oh, a color one. Oh, thank yeah. you. That's because I like appreciate it so that. Much. Uh, this past month, uh, there's been a amazing amount of progress on the uh, natural gas utility project, uh, consistent with the request from the committee last month. Richard has uh, had prepared a draft RFP for the natural gas utility uh, RFQ. RFQ, excuse me, RFQ. It says RFP on the front, though. I thought I changed that. Uh, in any event, whatever. Mine's RFQ. My, mine's an RF. Mine's RFP. <laughs> okay. RFQ is on the second page. In any event. I must have changed the sewer one that I've been working on. And, and Richard forwarded a draft to Tim and I, who were the uh, contact points for the committee, and we head back to Richard some uh, comments for uh, potential incorporation into his draft and he has redrafted the request 
and it is now in front of you and uh, assuming everything has been put in there um, you know we were really happy with it to begin with and, it, and, and if it's in there to, there are some places I want to make sure it's right this request it's, for qualification. Con it's consistent Richard what so you can be heard in the microphone why don't you sit okay. down and, and, and if you turn to page four yeah which is, Richard's going to go through the updated uh, mm -hmm. draft which is paragraph five of the, the submittal instructions and it's kind of outlining how we'd like to see the, the information they provide us but but, mm -hmm. but paragraph three of that submittal instructions is scope of work yeah that's the meat meat and, of the thing you know I've, I've tried to put the bullet points in there like you described which mm -hmm. the first one is prepared the gas system map for high pressure distribution system modeling and then I've got to prepare the gas system for low pressure distribution system model because there were a few places during that cold weather we had we had some low pressure, low pressure. Few places mm -hmm. we need to see where the best option op opportunities are to, to fix that and then we're going to prepare the map and the database for DOT compliance record keeping you know when with gas systems you're going to have leak surveys and you got to do every five years you got to do the entire system so we, we, you need to keep track of what you're doing and typically you'll do one fourth of it a year so you're always ahead of that five-year schedule but we'll, we'll, we'll try to start using our GIS mapping system for DOT compliance which will also include asset management for regular station maintenance valve maintenance and, and leak survey where, where we wind up repairing the system will document what we did and how we mm -hmm. did it so we'll have when, when we have auditors come in from the Public Service Commission, we'll have that information readily available for them. And, and we're also looking to prepare those assets to be uh, married to the Munis software system that we've got now for work orders. Mm -hmm. And I just, we just had the Munis rep in this morning and we were talking about, you know, to make sure that the, the people doing the mapping upgrades can talk to the right. Munis people and, and we make mm -hmm. sure everything is done so that it, it's seamless in terms of being able to create a work order, close the work order to where it populates itself in the proper location of the map and, and the work order system itself. So we're, we're working hard to try to make sure we're efficient about how we do that. And then, then I'm asking them to describe the, the methodology by which we look at cast iron replacement over a five year period. So, and, you know, basically they're going to share their qualifications for, for those levels of service that we're asking for. And then we'll have, you know, hopefully three or four firms that, that have that capability to, to look at and mm -hmm. decide how we want to do uh, if we want to contract for specific items of work or if we want to try to just get somebody to work with throughout the whole process and we'll see how that goes yeah the uh, kind of the read between the lines on some of this is that on the high pressure uh, side we were concerned about two things one of which is just outright capacity and ability to grow our high pressure system do we have enough to right need more ahead. and do we need parallel lines, which is the other thing for redundancy? Yeah, and you wind up with two different issues with that. One is we, we've got a set MDQ, which is a maximum daily quantity we can provide, but mm -hmm. they're, they're in the, these uh, severe cold events or, or places where production is curtailed, we may start to lose pressure on our supply line. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to do is model that system so that we know at the 225 pounds we're delivered at today we, we can get you know high enough pressure at the at the bottom end of the system where the regulator stations we have for, for low pressure distribution are satisfied and those capacities are met but as that pressure starts to fall when when you get to 175 pounds for example what's the pressure going to be at the bottom of your system and then at 150 so when you start working on a curtailment plan within the system, you look at the interruptible contracts you have and you start looking at people that you can call that are maybe non-essential. You know, you don't want to cut residents off, you don't want to cut hospitals off, but you know, if you have a, a facility that's not necessarily dependent for life safety issues, then you'll, you'll call them and ask them to shut their gas off or you'll go cut it off if they don't want to, but it, it's all understood and, and and uh, interruptible contracts for each of those services. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal of, of being able to model it 
then you can look at what pressures start to trigger different uh, levels of curtailment. And you want to take, you know, the, the, the customer that can afford to be off first, be off first, and then you start working your way up if it gets to that point. But that, that's mm -hmm. one of the be benefits of having that model. Yeah. Now, I was, I was very pleased uh, at how this had turned out. And uh, I, I think it's important to get this out here so we can get ourselves moving on and I've got March 9th, which is yeah. tomorrow on this, so I think I am going to go through one more time, and then I'll forward everybody yeah. electronic versions of it, but I, but I think getting it out sooner is better. The sooner is better, and, and that way we can get the information back and get it out in front of us. And, um, you know, on the hills of trying to work towards some uh, significant sewer capacity uh, mm -hmm. issues in town, we, we don't want to go through and try to whether it's Church Street or whatever, you know, the, the areas in town, yeah. go in and start looking at a sewer issue and then not fix everything. That's, right. that's mm -hmm. what we want to try to accomplish. So having these measures in place with consultants available when we need them, we'll have that. Uh, Paige or Will, you have any questions for Richard? No, <laughs> very thorough. Okay. All well, right. then uh, I, I like your plan, and we'll, we'll just wait for the final, and then we can uh, make sure council tomorrow. gets it, and then we'll we'll uh, move on. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, is this going to be presented to council at the work session, or the the one that we did for sewer? Sewer, we got will, is already out. Actually. Right. Right. Uh, and I, I'll present that Monday night to so serve. I have Thursday time there, but we're, we're getting those back. I, I believe a week before. I think it was the March. No, he's asking day. if the if the request the oh, RFQ you, itself could be presented at the work sure, session. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, the updated. Yeah, that's that's the goal. Because then they, if they have any questions, they can ask them, sure. and you can move forward with distribution. Absolutely. Okay. Sounds good. It's a great effort. Thank you, Richard. Well, I appreciate it very much. How do we do? Sir, how do we do on your goal? Uh, you know, uh, I'm working harder than I thought I needed to, but I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm still sleeping at night. So I'm all right. <laughs> I would. Uh, uh, is is Mayor still here? Is she? No, there she is. Uh, would you mind, as long as we're on the subject of, of utilities and and things that flush in the night, would you mind updating the committee on the recent decisions by the uh, whatever that group is the, that wants to spend the BP money? Because right. you had some pretty significant, I mean, I don't want to hear about all the projects, but the ones no, that I'm affect the, uh, yeah. I mean, well, Richard, yeah. help me. <laughs> well, so he, he did it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, the Restore Council. The Restore Council for, um, the BP funds for bucket one and bucket three. Um, we voted for both buckets and um, we were unanimously awarded uh, four projects. One was the uh, land use that right. we talked about. Um, one is 338. That's the. Um, it's $10 million for the first phase of um, sewer. That's what we but want to hear. Um, what we are putting in the uh, proposal and how we want to do it, because all of bucket three is for clean water. Mm -hmm. And so, what we want to work towards, because this is, you know, the overall price, and you can help me better than that if you want to come up here, but um, this is to go towards. Uh, a facility that will hopefully eliminate spills into the and in, to the bay we don't want to use this money just for upgrades that the city should already do mm -hmm. but I mean it's a huge step in the right direction because I think it's gonna be able to help out with doing all of the other infrastructure needs that we are need right now. Are you suggesting a greenfield site or are you suggesting improvements to the existing? Yeah, we're, we're doing so improvements. I mean, it yeah, includes. Mostly yeah. Okay. So we're not looking at a greenfield site somewhere right now. Okay. We're not looking at a new facility somewhere. Some of the rehabilitation work will include new facilities and we'll mm -hmm. try to partner where growth issues can be part of that. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's the rehabilitation okay. of, mm -hmm. of the age right. difference. Mm -hmm. but, 
but some of that um, those upgrades if you don't have that forethought on where you're going to put it mm -hmm. then you know those upgrades change and you can speak better to those details but you know now that we you know have something where we can plan uh, potentially a new facility for the growth the upgrades that are in the plan right now for immediate that will change mm -hmm. because the future will be directing it to another plant okay so is it, in your opinion is this money fairly certain or is it still speculative it's 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 certain it has to go through Treasury but we had already these um, all the plans engineered and went through Volkert also who is working with Treasury and um, the only thing that they asked were specific to clean water in other words there is a component of sewer upgrades that has a 25% cap on infrastructure and they changed that so you there was no cap as long as it shows that you're gonna your end goal is that you're gonna be cleaning the water so those were some things that we had to update and mm -hmm. we complied with everything I mean we still have a lot of work ahead but um, thank God we had the the sewer study because time wise we were shovel ready with that study to go for I mean the the whole amount that I asked for was not approved um, but this is a huge step in the right direction so Richard in your view then do we do we re need to redo the sewer study or we just need to add to it or what no we're, we're, we got a camera truck that's coming in mm -hmm. late May early June and, and this rehabilitation work will be about rehabilitating the, most of the, the old gravity system that's clay. There'll mm -hmm. be manholes to repair, there'll be uh, lines to uh, replace or slip line or put cure in place pipe in and then there'll be lateral replacements to, to the limits of what we manage which will be the right of way. Right now, what we're going to do is die test on the outfall line. There's an upwelling just offshore, and, and mm -hmm. there's a concern that our outfall system is split. Yeah. So we need to do that. But the, the the quality of you know the water quality issue that is the basis for this is about reducing or eliminating overflows, and it's about reducing and eliminating inflows that affect the quality of the treatment we have at the plant. So that's where these projects have to be specific to those items. But that's not to say, like when we do the Church Street work, there'll be some capacity upgrades for outside areas that, that bring water in here, but we'll also take some of that money and, and upgrade the entire gravity system that's serving the customers there now because it's part of the, you know, old, Pipe. But we need to be able to video to, to document the condition mm -hmm. of it and make sure that it's, you know, the, the worst of what we have to, to work on so that we're trying to get the most out of the money we do spend on the, on the upgrades. And then it's, 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 so when we go through each of these projects, then we'll probably separate the sewer system into sectors and we'll approach each one. Like one of the issues was the Grand Hotel and that lift station because when it gets inundated, the lift station at Twin Beach Road is overloaded and it overflows there. So we're trying to address that problem. The other station we're doing with this particular project for the, for the first phase of this capital improvement work is the, the Fells Mobile mm -hmm. Street lift mm -hmm. station. It's, it's uh, the, the deterioration of the wet well is fairly significant. The pumps are pretty old and, and we've worked on them several times just since, you know, and I've been here and that's, you know, almost too many times to, to have a pump station that receives flow from as far south as Wenzel's all the way across, you know, everything that flows down to the bay to that station is where it all winds and up. Eventually. Potentially it could be relocated to a slightly better spot. And, we, and we'll, look, we'll look for that too. Mm -hmm. And then if the you other got a recommendation for where to put it, <laughs> I'll, I'll be happy. Further away from my house, that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> we'll, we'll look at that then. <laughs> And do you want to explain that the, we also were awarded the Eastern Shore Sanitary Sewer Overflow? Yeah, I'd I like wanted to hear do something that, um, to, to that, plan that for. Project, uh, and I'm going to speak with Danny Lynn a little bit more with Daphne, but it, we're going to maybe look at uh, 
side stream storage capability that, that you know when we have a series of lift stations that, that pump from one basin to the next to the next well there comes a point when there, there's a, a, a place in that system where if that pump station could just fill up a, a hundred thousand gallon tank somewhere close by instead of trying to pump it into the next system downstream where it can't be handled anymore mm -hmm. we can stack it up and, and wait until the, the flow is diminishing and start feeding it back into the system, you know, where when it can be handled. So that would be the goal of that is to look at locations for side stream storage. And then we may look at, and what I'm trying to promote maybe will be to, to do some smoke testing in, in you know, earnest and, and say we're going to do some, a lot of smoke testing and, and each of us will pass these, these sewer use ordinances where you know, you won't have a choice but to, you know, have to fix what's on your property or, mm -hmm. or we'll find some mechanism to have local plumbers do it and, and find some way to, to put, recover. Put a lean back on the house or something. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. that's important. I'm sorry? Put a lean back on the house for the well, that's, recovery that's, cost. Yeah, if, if they're owed money on the work, whether yeah. it's a, we take it in payments or mm -hmm. we, however it works out, yeah, there'll be a, a, a lien that'll have to be part of that. Arrangement. But, but that plan really is to, you know, take care of the low-hanging fruit, and I, and I think it's going to be really right. a big, big deal. Yeah. And it would take up half of the shoreline, mm -hmm. and hopefully be modeled on the other side of the bay. Yeah. Well, I'm very impressed. So. I, you know, getting those projects through is is, is great. I'm it, very happy it's to a, see a that. It's a lot of work, and, and we're very uh, excited. So congratulations. Thank my you. My question is that this. Um, this money can only be spent for clean water. It can't be spent for any other utility work, right? No, it's for sewer, yeah. But only. Right. Yes. Yeah. And that's the, what compounds all of this is that as soon as we start, if we wind up having to dig the streets up, or if we see that there's a, a weak stormwater system in place, or we see there's a, a water system that could be upgraded, I mean, now's the time to do yeah. that and that's, right. and that's the want to do it you don't know because this will yeah. pay for doing until that you yeah. get a full and survey of all the utilities right. you know where the conflicts may or may not be and know that's why it's important to, to get all these initial it's got this. studies done absolutely like the gas study all of that. well we already know we have to replace those well i know but where does that where does that money come the, from the people in place that can help the, yeah. the, the projects we have a, we have we infrastructure do. accounts okay and we also are going to have a lot more profit in gas. And but um, on the BP grants, the mm -hmm. BP money, that's 100% money, right? Yep. We don't have to match. That's 100%. So, so that's another huge oh, advantage it's, it's over huge. I'm going to definitely grants. give everybody more details yeah. on it because it's, yeah. it's a big, huge gift to All the right. community. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then one last comment for the committee is that uh, during this next month in preparation for the April meeting, um, I'm going to uh, uh, probably ask one of you, uh, Tim or Will or Paige, to meet with me and uh, separately initially with a couple of the council members and then separately with the mayor and her staff, probably Mike because I want to start exploring funding options, particularly for electric and gas. I know we don't have final numbers yet. We don't know how big the nut is. We have approximations that were worked out. But I want to start getting some ballpark ideas, to your point, of uh, you know, where's the money going to come from. I know, I know that Jack and Robert have some thoughts on it. I'm sure Mike and the mayor have some thoughts. And I thought by starting to get, gather facts again, and then start trying to put this thing into shape so we generally know how we're going to approach it and then after that we start talking about the same thing for the other two pieces the sewer and the, uh, what we may need for the uh, waterworks and things like that so if that's agreeable with you all that that's my thinking on how the next month can be can be productively spent well, you got that plan you got part of the plan is paying for it it's yeah the biggest part yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we'll yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, is there any other public participation, sir? Yeah, if, if I could, I'd just throw out a couple of little finance-related items. Um, I know the two Richards and the Mike are excited about this. 
our new purchasing manager will be here on March 19th. Oh, yeah. Monday. Congratulations and to if, you all. If Jillian Sapple, the blind, have bled the blind long enough. Uh -huh. um, and, and I know that one of the mayors, and as well as all of us is at, at the, at the, uh, in the staff level, is we have a pretty confusing procurement process. Um, and some of it, even when you look at state bid law, it designates $15,000 activities versus $50,000 and above 50, but less than 500, and above 500. And the standard in the state, the bigger, bigger the procurement, the more uh, compliance that has to be done. And unfortunately, the system that we're burdened with, we treat a $5,000 professional service contract the same way we do a $300,000. And it really, one, it's not fair to the city council because they spend a lot of time dealing with items that are relatively small in nature, but because of that. And one of the things that we're going to work on as a team, and, 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 and maybe get y'all to help with that before we can talk, is trying to get a uniform procurement policy that is, that is clear, concise, meets all of the you know, state bid, especially like right now, we're dealing with the FTA project federal transportation, and good Lord, they just invented a whole bunch of other procurement requirements, but at least acknowledges it when it's these, that there are higher standards to be met. And that's something we want to start, as we get the team together, start drafting that and, and get y'all's input, because it, it's cumbersome. Um, and I think it's unnecessarily cumbersome because, you know, for example, on, on professional procurement right now, if I needed $4,750 worth of surveying, me to do an engineering design for, for to go out on the streets with. Right now, our procurement requirement says we go out for qualifications. Now, the problem is the state licensed surveyors as PLSs. If you're if you're if you're qualified with a state license as a PLS, you're already qualified to do just about every basic survey and from topo to boundaries, mm -hmm. wetland delineations, whatever. But we requalify them. Somebody in the state is already qualified and. Then once we've qualified them, we rank them, and we have to come back to council and say, this is who we think is qualified to do this work. Council says then, okay, you may now allow the mayor to negotiate that fee and bring it back to council. If it was a $3 million sewer improvement, you, you turn right. Like that, that rises to that level where you go through all those steps to make sure you have vetted. If it's a $4,750 surveying project, but that seems to be, and those are the kind of things we want to identify that, that it's not only the dollar amount, but what is the function and things of that nature. So in the future, we're going to hope to be bringing you some, well, where we are today, where we think we need to I'm, to I'm glad you brought that up because the, um, going back to when the committee was first formed, both the mayor and a couple of the council members independently brought up my attention and it's on our list somewhere that we've published that one of the things we'd like to get involved with is to help improve the efficiency and the efficacy of the purchasing system. I have deliberately not brought it to the fore knowing that you know we got personnel changeover coming and when the new person gets in it's going to take him a while him or her to learn where the bathroom is and to understand and you know and bring in his or her own ideas on how to best do it and have a chance to work with you all as a team. But we definitely would like to be involved with that because I know particularly Will and Paige uh, have some experience I think would bear on that. And we'd, and it's important not just for the, the efficiency of getting it through the approval process, but also, as you point out, making sure that we punch all the buttons for the compliance issues and that we pick the best people and get the best prices. So uh, we're, we're all for that. So we're, we'll kind of wait for you as the team to come back and say, now we'd like a little, you know, we've got our own ideas. We'd like to have a little bit of in, uh, independent in, input. And so we can, we can come all come together and then have something that we can bring back to the mayor and the council and say, this, this is a better mousetrap now. And we all are in favor of it for these reasons. So yes, we're very open to that, and I'm glad you brought it up. Can I ask a question, just just for my understanding? Is this a regulatory issue, or is it more of a process or procedural issue, or both? Well, generally, in my experience, both working for Bowen County and the 
city of Daphne, their procurement policies were based on state bid law, mm -hmm. unless a higher standard applied. Right. That if it was a federal, trans uh, federal transportation or federal highway funds, then you had to, to rise to that higher procurement responsibility. I will tell you this city has a quite a number of self-created documents that regulate things to a nth degree that's not required by state code, it's not, mm -hmm. not even required by federal code in some cases, that are just uh, systematically cumbersome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and for example, I understand you know, when we have a council meeting, the deadline to turn in an agenda item that involves spending money is the Wednesday following council meeting. So basically when you walk out of there on Monday night, and it, you've got at best uh, a day and a half to get that. So if you've got to go through three steps to do a very small procurement, that may be eight weeks at best. And sometimes because you don't have a document or you haven't got a response from somebody and you miss that one Wednesday, well then you roll over you know, to two weeks later. and. And then I see the frustration sometimes for our city council. Why hasn't this got done? You know, they're frustrated. They, they, you know, and and in some of it is we're we're trying to hit all the buttons, so to speak. So, and that's what just something that that, that gives comfort to the council because they're going to have to adopt it if they choose to, but makes sense. And then also, uh, you know, there's been a, a lot more emphasis set on making sure you're including advertisement to disadvantaged business enterprises, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses. Incorporating some of that updated, uh, there's there's a bunch of new language out there that we just need to clean up what we're doing. So, okay. And I will say in general, I concur with what Richard said. Okay. The secretary is making notes. Just a second. What for? Wherever get the minutes. <laughs> that that really cuts. That really cuts. So so really, while he's taking the, the minutes and everything, the compliance issue is part of it, which is more of a legal matter and so forth. You need to make sure you got that. But in terms of just getting it done and improving the efficiency of your process, it seems like it needs more tweaking. It's over yeah. Is the issue? Yeah, I understand. It's not. Okay. We meet twice a month. I mean, if you meet, if you miss one meeting, you got, you get in the next meeting. Yes, yeah. you still have a, a process for that to go through. It's not just a one vote. You got to approve negotiating, and then it's what a two or three step thing. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll. we'll that's that's what he we'll, said. We'll 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 work on it. We'll we'll find something that everybody can live with. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. The meeting's adjourned.